The town is much prouder of the fact that it's also the home of a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. 81-year-old Ray Flaherty is a fascinating man who grew up with Bing Crosby, was a teammate of both Babe Ruth and Red Grange, and won 73% of his games during seven years as head coach of the Washington Redskins. But Ray Flaherty is best remembered for the game he would most like to forget. In 1940, the Redskins lost a championship game to the Chicago Bears by the most lopsided score in NFL history, 73 to nothing. Well, I was the head coach of the Washington Redskins when we were defeated by the Chicago Bears, 73 to nothing in the 1940 playoff game. There's not very much you can say when you lose a game 73 to nothing. I told him it was one over par. Ray Flaherty's career is worth more than a footnote in football history. His best friend was Bing Crosby, and they both rose to national prominence during the 30s. They grew up together in Spokane, Washington, where they were classmates and buddies. Well, Bing and I, we were great friends. We used to go out and swim. We used to go out and play semi-pro baseball. We used to go out in the evenings and we could borrow our dad's car or something. We'd go out to the lakes of the dances and one thing and another, and we had some great times. Yeah, we were always great friends. And then when Bing got into pictures, of course, he was a very big man, and he would have our players come out to the studio for lunch or something, and he'd call them all by name. I don't know whether he got a program or how he did it, but he'd say, hello, Bill, hello, Joe. He knew them all by their first name. Bing was the singer, and Ray was the jock. Good enough to play second base for the Boston Braves, and good enough to play for Red Grange's barnstorming New York Yankees football team, who once played 24 games in one season, all on the road. He moved to the Giants, where he led the league in receiving and took pride in his toughness. Well, I think I was a very good blocker for my size. I was blocking against fellows that were usually much larger than I was. But some of them shook me up pretty good sometimes, but I held my own most of the time, and they always had me play the strong end. The strong end became an even stronger coach as he took over the last place Boston Redskins. After one season, the Redskins were Eastern Division champions, then moved to Washington. Here comes the Washington squad, 30 strong and 30 tough. Here's coach Red Flaherty with some of the boys, anxious to put on a good exhibition for the benefit of owner George Marshall and his wife, the former Corrine Griffin. George Marshall was the type of a fellow that liked to get a lot of publicity. He didn't care what they said about him as long as he got his name in the paper. George would make a lot of noise and say, I did this in the paper, I did that, but uh, he would never make a move of any kind until I okayed it. He came down to the bench one time in Philadelphia, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked around, it was George Marshall. And he says, Ray, we got to win this game. I said, George, that's what I'm trying to do. I said, you go back up and sit in those stands, because if you don't, you take the football team, pay me off, and I'll go on home. Marshall used to come out on a, a practice field, and Ray used to get us all together. He said, everybody in. And Marshall would say, well, practice over already? Ray said, when you step out on this practice field, automatically it's over. Marshall interfered, but he was willing to pay for the best college talent like TCU's Sammy Ball. Slingin' Sam was Washington's star attraction, and with number 33 in charge, the Redskins were able to challenge the NFL's greatest team, the Chicago Bears. In fact, it was a Washington victory over Chicago during the regular season in 1940 that helped set the stage for pro football's day of infamy. Two weeks previously, the Redskins beat them 7-3. Subsequently, George Marshall, the owner of the Washington Redskins at that time, plastered his newspapers with stories about the Bears being crybabies over losing that game. And George Hallis took every newspaper clip in which the Bears were denounced as crybabies and immature and so forth. And that was really his pep talk before the game. He said, you see these statements up here? You see what they say about you? You're the best team in football, but you've got to prove it today. came out that Sunday afternoon for the championship game, we looked beat, and they looked like a bunch of racehorses come out there. And after one play, that first play of the ball game, Bill Osmaski won 80 yards. That was it. I was a headliner, and I had to run down the field with, with Osmaski. And George Wilson, playing right offensive end, came over to the left, took two Redskins out with one magnificent block, maybe the greatest block in a championship game to ever be seen, to clear the path for Osmaski. I think we made more first downs in the game than they did, but they made all the scores. We just kept throwing the ball, and the Bears kept picking it off. The 
kick so many balls in the stands. The only thing we had left there is an old round ball that the water boy had. So I went to Sid Luck and I said, Sid, don't kick this. God, that's the last ball we got. He said, okay, Frank, we won't. And they passed it and completed it. <laughs> <laughs> that was just one of those days that everything went right. With the score 60 to nothing, as I recall, the field announcer made the announcement that, ladies and gentlemen, now is the time to get your season tickets for next year. 60 to nothing was the score, and the uproar all pointed at George Marshall sitting in an open box. They started to pelt him with everything possible and boo him. Everybody on the field got a chuckle out of that one. It was remarkable, not only because the team was so magnificent in its performance that day, but because it established the T-formation as the outstanding formation of the day. A lot of people said it was the T-formation that did it. T-formation didn't have anything to do with it. To speak of, I don't think it was their defense that uh, intercepted eight passes, ran four of them back for touchdowns, and then scored after the other four interceptions, too. But uh, you can't let that worry you. You can't worry about the past. You've got to just do the best you can and start thinking about the next one. Ray Flaherty didn't let one defeat keep him out of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He finished his career with two wins and three championships against the Bears, before retiring with a clear conscience to peaceful Hayden Lake.